you got your copy of God's Word, Acts chapter 19 and verse 20, um, I'm going to just look at one verse tonight. And you may say, how long can we talk about one verse? Well, if, you're, if you know very many preachers, you can talk about one verse for a long time. I've known guys that have done a whole a series, not just one sermon, but a series around John 3.16. Nothing wrong with that, just saying how you know, different approaches you can take to God's Word. So Acts chapter 19 and verse 20, we're going to look tonight at the church that God blesses. The church that God blesses. And I don't think anybody goes to church thinking, wow... I really don't expect God to bless us, or I don't care if God wants us to. Want, I don't care if God blesses us or not. We, there's a desire for for God to bless us. So, Acts chapter twenty, F chapter nineteen, excuse me, in verse twenty. So mightily, and, and I like that word there, mightily. It doesn't just say that the word grew, but it mightily grew. And when I think of something that's mighty, when it grows, it's strong. It it's not overpowered. Uh, it's able to withstand things. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for uh, this time this evening as we meet together in the middle of the week to pray, to sing praises unto You as we just did a moment ago that we're reminded that You're the rock we stand on tonight. We know that um, a church that You're going to bless has to be a church that's anchored on You and focused on You and Uh, there's a temptation to just look to so many things. Uh, But we know we have to keep looking to You uh, for the challenges we face, for growth, for for any blessing that we have to be um, looking to You, Lord. As You lead, guide, and direct us in this time in Your Word, may we be steadfast in our our attentiveness to it. Um, Help us to take away what You want us to take away. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Something that I've thought about, and I think it's appropriate that we've come to this, is uh, uh, I want this to be a church that God blesses. And when I don't see the blessings I think I ought to see, I, I have a tendency, and it's just something I'm going to always fight with, it's not right, but I'm, it's always going to be a struggle, I wonder, what am I doing wrong? Or what is it that I'm not doing that I need to be doing? But I'm reminded right here that it comes back to the Word of God and that it's the Word of God that grew and prevailed. It it, it wasn't a church that prevailed. It wasn't a preacher that prevailed. It's the Word of God that prevails. And ultimately, it's Jesus Christ that prevails. And uh, one of the things that I think we need to keep going back to, and and when I came here two years ago, um, I I didn't come here to, 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 to just give up. I didn't come here to... To fail, uh, but but I come here wanting to see lives changed, and lives changed. A lot of times we we think when somebody leaves behind a lifestyle of drugs, alcohol, robbing banks, that's a change, and that is a changed life. But man, it was good to hear a testimony Sunday morning from somebody that simply said, "I know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I want to know Him better." And what a, what a powerful testimony that was from somebody who, to be quite honest with you, I said this Sunday, I said this to her when she came to me, I don't know what you need to repent of. But, but, but God put something on her heart. God's tugging on her heart. And God's tugging on her heart not because I preached a barn-burning message, but God's tugging on her heart because she's hungry. And that's where that starts with a church that God blesses, that that we have to be hungry. Which brings us to the first point tonight, a church together. And this church was meeting together here that we're uh, talking about here in Acts chapter number 19. Uh, We see back in verse 18 that uh, many that came confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also brought, or excuse many of them, also, which used curious arts, brought their books together, burned them before men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. That wasn't just chunk change that you used at the arcade back in the 80s. That was a lot of money. They could have went and sold that, but they believed that that stuff was so detrimental to their family, their community, their church, that they didn't just go and sell it. They went and burned it. 
So this was a church that was not only together, but together in the Spirit. The churches in the book of Acts are marked by a loving fellowship, what the Bible describes as being in one accord. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, going all the way back to the beginning of our study, these all continued in one accord in, with one accord in prayer and supplication. That's where it starts. That's why I've stressed trying to be here if we can on a Wednesday night. Because part of being a accord is praying together. And, and, and asking God to do things together. Even if you don't utter a single word in a prayer service. But if you're there and you're silently praying in your pew. Because I understand that, that praying out loud in front of people. That's not for everybody. But something that is for everybody is coming together and praying. And even if you're sitting there and you don't utter a single word out loud. Even if you're sitting there doing what Hannah did and in First Samuel chapter one, and you're just mouthing, but you're you're not uttering anything that can be heard by man. God hears your prayer, and God knows your heart, and knows that your heart and your attempt is to be in one accord. It says there that they were making prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So these weren't just the pastors coming together. These weren't just the leaders. This was everybody. Everybody that could pray, everybody that had access to the Lord Jesus Christ was there. And Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 talks about them also being in one accord. When It says, "...and the day of Pentecost was fully come," meaning when all the activity happened, when the Spirit came and the Spirit worked. It says, "...they were with one accord in one place." This was a loving people. And continuing discipleship, continual pursuance of the Lord Jesus Christ is based on love for the Savior and love for one another. So part of loving our Savior is, is part of what we heard Sunday morning from, from a precious uh, lady in our church about not only knowing Him as Savior, but knowing Him better. And sometimes it comes down to also knowing people better. And, and one of the videos I've made to try to invite people, I always say, come out and join us so we can meet you and get to know you better. So my goal when somebody comes through our church... Learn their name and try to learn something about them. It's okay to be a little nosy. Now, if you start asking things like, where were you on 9-11? You know, that, that might be a little creepy. But something, hey, if you, did you grow up around here? You know, what, what do you do for a living? Just, just, I guarantee you, if you can remember people's name and something about them, just one thing. I'm not asking you to memorize the timeline of their life and reproduce it for a test. Although that would be pretty amazing if you could do that. But if you could learn somebody's name and something about them, people would be impressed by that. Even if it's, hey, they've got a dog at home named Sophie or Fufu or whatever. If you could just name one thing about them or remember one thing about them and then ask them about that. Maybe you remember the name of their grandkid. And you say, how's that grandkid? And you, remember, you throw out their name ask them how they're doing. Acts chapter 4, verses 31 through 32 talks about them being together. It says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. So we see this activity here going on. And it happened when they prayed. It didn't happen when they had this huge event. All they were doing was praying. And, and, and the Lord shook things up here, figuratively and, and physically here. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the Word of God with boldness. Uh, we're not going to do anything for the Lord if we're not praying. We have to be praying. If, if we're not praying, we're not going to do anything with boldness and confidence. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought, uh, that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. The thrust of the idea of unity was that believers had one mind, one accord, one passion. The Bible uses a unique uh, Greek word. To help us understand the Christian community, uh, homothon, if I'm saying it right, is a compound of two words means to rush along in unison. Only the Holy Spirit can take people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different statuses, different experiences, all these things, and, and bring them into a harmonious unit. When, when, when it's a beautiful thing when God can bring somebody that maybe they've got a background in, in, in business and maybe they've ran a, a business and, and you know the, the, the biggest sin they committed was when they were 10 years old stealing a, stealing a candy bar from the Dollar General. And they wouldn't know the difference between street drugs and vitamins at Dollar General. When God brings somebody like that towards somebody that, that for 40 years of their life 
uh, were in uh, drugs and running and gunning, uh, but they got out of that. But you know what? Because of Jesus, those two people can come together and they, and they both know that they needed the same Savior. They were in the same gutter without Jesus. Regardless of, well, my, my biggest sin or my biggest crime was stealing a candy bar or lying to my you know, fifth grade teacher or uh, you know, taking drugs or whatever the case. The book of Acts shows time and time again how the Holy Spirit brings people together and, and brings them together in a place where they can praise God in a beautiful way where, where they make music together. Not just literal music, but, but it's, it, 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 it sounds good. And music paints a picture. And, and when you, what you can see here is these people working together, then putting their differences aside, their pride aside, because one person might have an idea to do this, another person might have an idea, and, and one just decides, you know, I think my idea is good, but it may not be best at this time for everybody, so put the idea aside and do what's best for the collective group. We need to remember why we're here. We're here to fight against sin, Satan and the flesh, not one another. In the early days of the invasion of Iraq, a man who served in the army threw a bomb into a, a tent and killed several of his fellow soldiers. Whenever we harbor bitterness, whenever we spread gossip, whenever we backbiting, we're bar- we are bombing our own. There was a gentleman down at, uh, I can't remember the fort now, there was a fort, I think it was Fort Hood in Texas, went in there and just started shooting up places. People, I mean, excuse me, in that place. He was shooting his own. Matthew 18 lays it out pretty well in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And if you're aware of what's going on at the big church on 65, they, they cited this passage. I could, I could talk about the context of that, but I'm just going to read it and, and let it say, what it, just let the Word of God speak for itself. Moreover, if thy brother, meaning that word, the word thy, singular, you, your, your brother, shall trespass against thee, trespasses against single you, not trespass against anybody else but you, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take one or two more witnesses, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word should be established. If he neglect to to hear them, tell it to the church. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and as a publican. It lays out right there, go to the person. Don't attack them publicly, go to them. I don't think I need to camp there. These people came together for a cause. The early church was unified in serving. Acts chapter 4 verse 32 says, The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which uh, he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. In other words, they were saying, Hey, what God has blessed me with, I'm going to use for the work of God. I'm going to use to get the gospel into somebody's life. I'm going to use to, to help invest into somebody else. This early church in Jerusalem saw the need and they took the need. I wouldn't even think of that when, when I was when we were having fun earlier when prayer sheets got passed out and I sold somebody I said, You're, you took my job away. And they, they just said, hey, you weren't doing it. And, and then I said, I didn't, I didn't even think about what I typed here because I typed this up weeks ago. And uh, I said, well, you saw the need and took the lead. And that's how things get done. That's really how things get done. Uh, I tell you what, you, you look at any business leader, you know how they test... The leaders that they're training, you guys will get a kick out of this. Some of you, you, you've probably seen this if you've done any type of management. They'll leave a piece of paper on the floor and see how many people walk by before they pick it up. And that, that tells you right there who's, who's really paying attention. I'm not going to do that here, by the way. At least not to, not to this crowd, anyhow. Might do it to some other people that, that think that, oh, I, I want to be in leadership. Well... Uh, my, my pastor friend in Kansas City, Sam Miles, he says, we don't promote you to leadership till we see a mop in your hand. Because if you're too good to do any of that, you don't need to be in leadership. Um, there were needs in the church and the people 
uh, counted their own possessions and, and uh, uh, as common use for the situation. They sold some things they had to meet some needs in the congregation. Their willing sacrifice was marked by total unselfishness. The earlier church was unified in soul winning. In Acts chapter 13, that's not too far back, um, verses 1-4 through four talk about that there were in the church that we, uh, that we are at Antioch, a certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simon, it was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up by Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said unto me, Separate Paul and or Saul and Barnabas for the work whereto I have called them. And when they laid, uh, they fasted and prayed, laid hands on them. They, uh, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia from thence or from that place, sailed to Cyprus. The main thing here was soul winning. Uh, when you are at war, you don't care where someone came from, what color they are, or any of that. You just hope that they can fight. When when you're in a when you're in a fight to, to, to in war, you, you don't care whether in, in wartime, uh, especially in World War II, there were people of different backgrounds in those foxholes and those places with those rifles up against them. They didn't care about the person's story next to them. They just wanted to make sure. Are you fighting for the same flag I am? Are you fighting for the same principles I'm willing to die for? Because if the answer is yes, we can go forward and go after that enemy. But when there's things going on, when there's bombs thrown in the tent, I'm sure that there's somebody probably tried to do that in World War II. I don't know, but I know when you fast forward years later, I don't know if it happened in Korean War, but in, uh, you get fast forward to, to Vietnam, war in Iraq, some of these other wars, there were ways that the enemy got real crafty and found ways to infiltrate our U.S. military. Sometimes... This is sad, but the story has to be told so we understand how the enemy around us works in this world, but also how Satan works. Some of these other nations would take kids, strap bombs to them, send them in somewhere where they knew American soldiers were. It's one kid in Vietnam would have a shoe shine box and go in there trying to shine shoes for a couple dollars. The box would be wired with explosives, blow blows the kid up, blows the soldiers up. I know it's kind of a bloody picture, but that's how the enemy, that's how the enemy in this world works. So think of how the enemy Satan works. And Satan plants strife spreaders in churches, just the same. Finds ways to get troublemakers in, just the same. There's also people that have been had bombs strapped to them that are mentally challenged. If, if that's a politically correct term I can use. The, the term used to be mentally retarded. Well, I was told you can't say that now. Even though back in 1982, my sister got diagnosed, and that's what the doctor said on there. I had to talk to my kids about that, about because they would kids at school like to use the word retarded, and I said, we, we don't use that. And I had to explain why and go into that, but that's a whole other story for another sermon maybe. Anyhow, it sent these people in there, they're mentally challenged, strapped with bombs, taken advantage of, which goes to show how the enemy, Satan's never going to reward anybody with sin. Just like God doesn't bless somebody that's in sin, Satan doesn't reward anyone in sin either. People think they're going to be rewarded because Satan wants them to believe that. But I've got to move on. These people are unified through trials. You may say, how can be you unified by trials? Acts chapter 7, 59 and 60 says, And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive... Uh, my spirit, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not their sin to their, the sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So, people can identify with Stephen. The, the, the Holy Spirit kept this these words alive so that people knew, hey, what Stephen's going through, I'm going through. In Acts chapter 8, the next chapter over in verse 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the, the word. So they were scattered, they were unified by the same trial Stephen had. They weren't being stoned at that moment, but people wanted to stone them. So they're running off, and, and they understand, hey, Stephen went through the same thing. Like every church does, we at Mount Zion have had our trials during our years of ministry here. 140 years, there is no way you can think, well, every single year has just been a high note. That's impossible. Any church, by the way, any church that's been around 
longer than a few days, has its problems. I remember one time when I was a youth pastor at a church on the west side of Springfield. When I went there, I think they were running maybe 30, 35 people. And after we were there for a while, got the youth group going. We were running 60s, 70s there. And uh, I was talking with the pastor, and uh, we had a college worker that was there with us. And uh, our music guys, there was like four, four of us kind of on staff, so to speak. And uh, I was talking about all these problems. And, and I said in the meeting, I said, the problems are good. And they looked at me funny, like, why are you saying the problems are good? I said, the problems are good because it means we have people. If we don't have any problems, it means we probably have empty pews. And empty pews don't need to be saved or changed. And they just kind of looked at me kind of funny. But when there's problems, it means there's people there. Because all of us are, are fallen. Um, you know, the biggest problem any marriage has is you're bringing two centers together. Even in a friendship, there's two sinners together that, that have to learn to give grace, love, and patience towards one another. And I'm going to talk about long-suffering on a Sunday, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. We've had to say goodbye at funerals to sweet members. You know, I've only been here about two years. I counted it. I've been a part of five funerals since I've been here. Five. That's a lot in two years. Now, um, one of those, maybe two of those, for sure one of those, I didn't even know the person at all. But it's still, it's, it's not any easier because you're watching a family grieve. You're watching a family talk about this person and kind of say that final goodbye, so to speak. Funerals are never easy. Like I've said, I want people laughing and smiling all the time, but that's not reality. If, if, if there's a trick I could do to make you laugh or smile, I'm going to do it. And if it means laughing at myself in the process, I'll do that too. But we've had to say goodbye to some folks. But God is faithful and able to use our trials to bring our hearts together and knit us into closer harmony with ourselves and with Himself. Secondly, we see a tested church here. A tested church... Um, we are purified through respect for the Lord. Acts chapter 5, 3 through 5, and, and I'm trying to hurry here. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land? You remember this when they, they said that here's, how, here's the land and here's how much it cost, here's how much we gave, and they lied about it. While it remained and was not thine own, and after it was sold, was it not thine own, pa- was it, uh, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. But Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon all them that heard these things. There was a fear and reverence as the church of, as the church realized they served a holy God. We we live in a society now that uh, there's not respect for church. I guarantee you, you go back in time a hundred years ago. On the, at, at this church, in this community, even if people didn't go here, there was respect for this church. Even a church of a denomination that I disagree differently, I would never go spit on their property. I would never go and, and paint graffiti over their building. Because even though I disagree doctrinally, that's still a building that's set aside for God. Even if I disagree with the methods, even if I disagree with the theology, because ultimately they answer to God, and that's set aside for God. It's no, no, it, it's disgusting, wicked, and evil to, to go and do things like that. There's no respect. Warren Worsby says that uh, this was not a case of church discipline here, since God dealt with these sinners directly. And boy, a church that God's going to bless is a church that's willing. To have God deal with them directly. The two deaths illustrate the kind of judgment God will exercise during the kingdom. In Jeremiah 23, 5 and Revelation 19, 5, which we don't have time to go into. This was a defined, definitive case of divine judgment. It's interesting to compare this to Joshua chapter 7 where Achan tried to hide his sin from God. And when they conquered Jericho and he went and hid the gold. And all the people around saw the hand of God at work. 
Churches today have forgotten the holy nature of God, but God hasn't changed. When we properly understand Him and we live in that fear, not like, oh, I'm scared of you, God, but no, this, this is a special place or this is a special work. And we realize that things are set apart for God in a unique way. When we live that way, the church prospers. Acts 9.31 says, And the churches rest uh, throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. So when we walk in that way where we're respectful of the things of God, it says here that they, that they had comfort in the Holy Ghost and they were multiplied. What we respect, other people are going to respect. If, if, if we're having the preacher for crow... Like the Sunday school teacher I talked about on Sunday, he was having the he was having preacher for crow in his Sunday school class. If if that's going on, if 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 people are doing that, and I don't think anyone in this room is doing that, but if if people are, if people do that, because I've I've been to churches and then I hear them complain about the pastor. I went candidated at a at a church done no longer in existence out in Dade County, not South Greenfield. South Greenfield's still going, but out in Dade County, and I went there Sunday morning and Sunday night. I had a guy come to me, complained about everybody else in the church on Sunday night. I'm thinking, there's problems. I didn't want to go back. Just being real. It's not good. We're purified through separation unto the Lord. Uh, Acts 19, uh, 18 through 20, uh, we looked at this and, and, and what they did and how they came together. They, were, they separated themselves from the curious arts in verse 19. And they came together and they burned those things. Separation in the Bible is not separation just away from things, but towards things. Um, we could talk about that, but uh, I've got to hurry. We're pur- you're purified through the purification of the truth of the Word of God. The only way for a believer to live a clean life is filling his heart and mind with the Word of God. Or filling her mind with the Word of God. And her heart with the Word of God. When a church makes much of the word, everyone involved learns the importance and methods of pure living. Uh, Ephesians 5.26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it, speaking of the church, with the washing of the water by the word. And then we see thirdly a taken church. A church that knows who they are and what they have. We, we forget about that sometimes. That's what we, we forget about when we're trying to witness to the Lord. We forget about who we are and what we have. You, by the way, you don't have to prove anything to anybody. If you're trying to witness somebody and say, if you're going to tell me, uh, uh, how can you prove God uh, God exists, what would you say? Uh, a, a guy I know that, that's a, a, a missionary in London, he had a Persian man come to him and, and say that. He says, I wouldn't say anything to you. Why would, I, why would I tell you something you already know is true? And God gave him the boldness to say, he wasn't trying to be mean or ugly to this guy, but... The guy, the spirit in which the guy came to. Now, apologetics is important. At some point on Sunday nights, down the, quite a ways down the road, we're going to go through some of that. But a taken church is one that is sanctified unto Christ. Everything in Acts centers around Jesus Christ. Acts 20, verse 20, it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own but you know who purchased the church of God? You know who church purchased you? It wasn't me. It wasn't the person with the fattest wallet. It was Jesus Christ. That's who purchased the church with His own blood. Nothing else. Nobody whipped out. There wasn't a daddy Warbucks that wrote a check and, and, and whipped it out. And if they do, they're, they're holding on to something that they didn't purchase. It's God's church. Now, we are to be stewards over it. We are to manage things and be as wise as we can with what God's blessed us with, but ultimately, it comes down to Jesus. The church is a called out assembly of believers by the very its very definition, the church is to be separated unto the Lord. Christ is the head of the church. The church belongs to Him. Since we have been bought by Christ, we belong to Him and our purpose is to glorify Him. Walking in holiness, which is commanded of the church, brings glory to God, means it gives Him attention. Sanctified through preaching, and these people, I don't, I'm not going to read all the verses because we need to hurry along here, but they preached about the resurrection. They preached about the life of Jesus Christ. They preached the Word. Acts 14.21 says, They preached the gospel of salvation. And when they preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystrum and Iconium and Antioch. Everything came around to proclaiming the Word of God that they had. 
Church growth doesn't have to be a mysterious process that we have to attend seminars to understand or catch up with some latest techniques. If we follow the pattern in the book of Acts, we can expect to receive the blessings of God which were mightily bestowed here at the church at Ephesus when it says here that mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. One of my favorite, I'll close with this before we go into our prayer time. One of my favorite type of videos is, you ever watch time lapse videos? And you watch the, the, the plant sprout up and grow? That's kind of cool to watch. I like watching those. That's what, I mean, if, I, if that was real time, that's mightily growing. And even in slow time, that's mightily growing, is what I have to tell myself. For anything to grow, it takes time. I've had to be reminded of that here lately. It takes time. Because I think, man, things ought to be kick-started. And sometimes, some places, things do get kick-started. But it takes time. It takes effort. I don't know if anybody here has done any farming or, or tried to grow any crops or maybe you try to grow stuff in your backyard. But it takes time. It's not like Jack and the Beanstalk where you throw the seeds down and you get that beanstalk up overnight. It takes time. You've got to go and you've got to water. Then you've got to do that. Throwing out manure. But stuff grows better with it. Which kind of reminds me some of the some of the thankless jobs in ministry are necessary for growth. And we'll stop there and we'll go into our prayer time. For more information, visit our website at mountzionozark.weebly.com. And thank you for watching. We would love the opportunity to meet you and get to know you better. Feel free to come visit during one of our services. Have a blessed day.